بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. My name is Wafaq Manasra. I serve as a Mass National Operations Manager. I'm very honored to be here today in front of you for today's session titled Blessed Families with Special Needs, Challenges, and Opportunities. With us, we have uh, Sister Ada and we have uh, Brother uh, Talib. Sister uh, Muhammad Sharif. She has earned her BA in Psychology from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and received certificates in Childhood and Adolescent Studies, as well as culture, Cultures and Community Studies. She is currently completing her master's degree in mental health counseling at Columbia University, mashallah, and she conducts <coughs> therapy and the counseling intern under supervision. She is formally trained in Arabic and Quran and Tafsir at Al Qasid Institute in Amman, Jordan. In the past, Ella has served on the Islamic Society of Milwaukee's Education Board and the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition as curriculum developer and is experienced with behavioral therapy, <coughs> intervention, and community education. She is presently a researcher and speaker with the Family and Youth Institute, mashallah, focusing on Muslim mental health curriculum development, advocacy, and literacy. Please join me in welcoming Sister Ella. And with us, mashallah, we have uh, Sheikh Talib Musleh. He is a graduate from the prestigious Medina University, where he attained his associate degree in Arabic and bachelor's degree from the College of Sharia. He completed his memorization of the Quran at the age of 13, mashallah, and went on to receive the jaza from, uh, from Palestine, Palestine. He studied classical Arabic at the Fajr Center in Egypt. Sheikh Tariq has worked as a part-time instructor for Islamic Learning Foundation Chicago, where he taught Quran and Arabic studies. He has served in Young Muslims for many years as a coordinator and murabbi. Sheikh Tariq has also served as the youth director for the Islamic Center of Naperville in Chicago and became the youth director and assistant imam at Mecca Center in Willowbrook, Illinois in July 2017. Please join me in welcoming Brother Sheikh Tariq. So for today's session, just a quick briefing for those of you who may not have access to the program. Uh, Prophet Sallallahu advised us saying, you are given a provision and virtue of the weak people among you. Although having a child or family member with special needs poses a challenge that needs special arrangements and resources, this member of the family is a source of blessings from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, and for his family and caretakers. Thanks to the medical and social advancements that made the life of these blessed family members easier, the session discusses the challenges families with special needs are facing and the opportunities in the community and society that can make their life easier. So the session will be um, a Q&A structure uh, between myself and the speakers. So they'll have a, a pre-assigned question that they'll get to answer um, to their comfort, inshallah. So the first question is for you, uh, Sheikh Tariq. Can you please share with us the virtue of taking care of someone with special needs and its blessings on the whole family? Bismillah uh, we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thanking Him. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala infinitely and abundantly. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send His peace and blessings upon our beloved and His beloved uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I think uh, I, I, I tend to be a difficult person. So I'll start this by saying that the framing of this question I struggle with because what it, what it insists is that we are the ones that take care of those with special needs. And what my experience is, and Allah knows best, this is not to take away from the tremendous amount of sacrifice that people who are the caregivers of special needs uh, endure, but it is a realization that I've had in working with those with special needs, particularly through Muhsin, the organization that's dedicated to Muslims understanding and helping special education needs, that oftentimes those with special needs take care of us more than we take care of them. And they provide for those of us that are deemed typical in society based off of the social constructs that we have, they provide for us a lesson, a 
an inspiration, a value, uh, and, and, and a motivation that without them would not be found. Uh, and that's why I think this idea of taking care of them is important and to realize that every moment of taking care of them is rewarding, but to know that in reality, we're all taking care of each other differently. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, That your success and my success, my provisions from Allah and your provisions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nasluna wa rizquna, our givens from Allah and our help from Allah, is rooted in how we engage with those that are most vulnerable amongst us, right? And so by being with those with special needs, by serving them, by listening to them, by being in their khidmah, that we find the opportunity, inshallah ta'ala, to earn a special reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also at the same time to have the opportunity, inshallah, to gain a connection with them in which we can actually learn from those individuals with special needs and their families. Sister, if you have any additional commentary, you're welcome. The next question for Sister Ella is, can you share with us some of the social and psychological challenges both individuals and families with a special needs member are facing? So yeah, first I want to, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us in this space and helping us create this space. Um, and then I want to put a disclosure, disclosure out there that I myself am not um, a caregiver for someone with special needs, um, nor do I have special needs. And maybe I do have family with special needs, distant family and close, close friends with special needs. Um, but I want to make that distinction um, because I can, my insight um, might come from an academic um, and an educational professional background, but my hope ultimately in us you know, sharing this space is that we open the conversation so that there's a comfort and a willingness to listen and build trust so that those who do have special needs and those who do um, care for family members with special needs feel comfortable to share with us because there's a learning and growing process that we all um, you know, I, I believe we need to grow together. Um, so I, to start with, I guess it's, when we talk about special needs, what this is referring to is impairments that affect an individual's functioning. So that could be um, functionings of physical functioning, uh, impairments with sensory, impairments with cognitive, um, intellectual, mental illnesses, and also chronic diseases. Um, and the reason I mention this is because there are there's a variety of ways that this could manifest for a person. Um, there's, individual, there's invisible um, manifestation, and there's a uh, visible manifestation of disabilities. And there is a distinction for us to consider when we're talking about disabilities from birth versus disabilities that um, are caused by brain injury. And then also there are unique needs for individuals at different stages of the, uh, so for example, a child with disabilities has unique needs or different needs than an adult with disabilities. And then when you consider the types of disabilities that elders um, endure, it's again a whole different cycle of, of needs. So I mention all of this so that I can state and put it out there that it's not one size fits all when we talk about special needs. And to recognize that if I talk about any of the social or psychological challenges that um, I may be able to present the general social and psychological challenges that research suggests families with special needs experience or individuals with special needs experience, but um, we shouldn't leave here assuming that this is what everyone goes through or this is what everyone is feeling. It should instead um, allow us to be a little bit more aware that this might be what someone is experiencing. And so my call would be that we, um, we ask, how are you doing? Um, instead of assume this person is not doing well or this person is fine, they have everything under control. So just to kind of start with some of the social challenges, in um, family members with special needs and individuals with special needs may feel, according to research, um, a sense of isolation 
from missing out because, uh, or missing out on family-oriented activities or activities within the masjid because their uh, specific disabilities are not accounted for in that space or because that disability may um, uh, prevent them from successfully engaging in the activities that are provided. They may also feel isolated because of encountering criticism or judgment. Um, for example, parents may be judging other parents without understanding that there is a unique type of parenting uh, re uh, re uh, needed or required in, in um, parenting children with special needs, for example, or caring for an adult with special needs. Um, so that the feelings of isolation um, actually separate a person and, and, and prevent connection. Um, other feelings like exclusion, I think our, our communities are trying to do a better job. Um, and I know Sheikh um, mentioned Mohsen, there are different ways that we can start making our communities inclusive, but the feeling of exclusion is very real for families with special needs. Um, and that is oftentimes, um, there are uh, events that don't account for disabilities or don't account for how um, to, don't account for the disabilities, but also there's a lack of opportunities. And if you think about our masjid spaces, how many board members do we see have disabilities or are representing family members with disabilities? And so there's a sense of inclusivity that um, I think we need to go a step beyond for. Um, and then another reason why exclusivity or feeling excluded um, may occur is because of a lot of misunderstanding. Um, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and, for lack of a better word, ignorance around what special needs and disabilities look like, feel like, and, um, uh, and how they affect a family. So, um, so being misunderstood. Uh, psychological challenges are very, very real in homes with special needs. Um, and that is oftentimes you'll find caregivers of individuals with special needs worrying and afraid that they're not doing enough for their family members or they're worrying about the future, or they're afraid that they can't provide all of the, um, that they're not providing safety and protection. So fear and worry is a very strong um, and important uh, psychological challenge that uh, family members and individuals with special needs feel, as well as grief, grieving over hopes um, and dreams of, of what they might have wished life to look like for them, or parenting to look like. Um, and then also this constant reminder of missing out. When you see that our communities have events and whatnot that just can't attend because the stairs, there was no way up, there was an accessibility. There's a sense of like a reminder of constantly missing out that I think is very important um, to consider. Um, also feeling guilty. Am I um, doing enough for my child? Or am I doing enough for my elder parent with dementia? Am I, um, for, am I, am I uh, leaving the other family members behind and caring um, so much for one of my one of my children or one of my family members. So there's a sense of guilt. Um, and then I want to talk about burnout because burnout is very, very real in families with special needs. And that is, there's two aspects of it. Burnout for caregivers, which caregiver fatigue is when a person is physically, um, psychologically, emotionally exhausted from the amount of work um, and, and, and and, and, and the amount of worry and the amount of um, what, what goes into the needs. Um, and this leads, this impacts their mood and impacts their function. And I think it's very important for us to recognize when we see family members that may be in a, a caregiver role, but this may be the feeling that they're feeling. Again, not to assume, but to open the door to ask, right, how are you doing? Can I help you? Is there something I can do? Um, and the second aspect is, the actual disability burnout, where an individual with a disability is feeling burnt out. And that burnout comes from, I mean, many things, but some of the things that I can uh, point to are um, the feeling of having to hide the disability. That can cause a sense of um, uh, imposter syndrome, right? Being burnt out from hiding that this is my real condition, um, or being under challenged. And I think that this is very important because oftentimes individuals with disabilities or special needs are um, underappreciated for the skills that they do have, and therefore they get bored. And boredom is a real problem, and it causes burnout. Um, and then there's 
just not having opportunities in the community spaces, not having opportunities for, for learning, for growth, for advancement, and that could lead to burnout. Again, I think it's really important to emphasize these are general, um, and it is not to assume that by having this information we know what a person might be feeling, but it's to, to I invite all of us to ask family members that we know um, that are challenged with disabilities or special needs, how are you doing? Is there anything that I can also contribute? Um, and then, and then secondly, it's to uh, invite family members with special needs uh, or disabilities to reach out and ask for help, and not to allow these uh, challenges to, to weigh you down and do not feel alone in them. Um, and, and seeking help from, from friends, from social circles, but also from professionals, because professionals can help you process these feelings at a deep level, and professionals can also um, provide resources and services that can help lighten the load. Barak Allah Fiki, that was, uh, that was amazing. Uh, I think just what comes to my mind, something that we always talk about at Marsin is opening hearts, not just doors. It's easy to open the doors of the masjid. It just takes a few thousand dollars and a launch good to change the stairs or the wudu area. But the thing that the community of those with special needs and their family struggles with the most is not the structures, it's the people within the structures. It's the idea that a child that has a special need may have something spiritually wrong with them. That you need to keep your kids away from them or that they need to be underserved because their spirituality is somehow less important, right? So I just want to make sure that we think about what does it look like for us to not just reconfigure the structures of our buildings, but what does it look like for us to reconfigure the social settings of our gatherings, our lunches, our uh, play dates for our children, our outings as a community, all of these things, like we have to rethink what they look like and the type of social and spiritual dynamics that make it truly a welcoming place for everyone involved. And Jazakumul Khairan to the sister for everything that she shared. And the next question for Sheikh Farid, within the current facilities and in around the Muslim communities, what are the challenges people with special needs are facing? I feel like we can, talk about, just, yeah. for, uh, we can talk about this for the entirety of the domestic yeah. convention. Um, so, Pedal, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me infinitely. And one of the greatest blessings that Allah has given me is the ability to go on Muhsin Umrah, to go on Umrah with those with special needs and their families. Now, and I'll never forget the first trip, and I was super excited because we were flying through Turkey, and I knew that they sold Turkish food in the, in the food court. So I was just trying to get my way to the food court to get some donor kebab. And some auntie I had never seen before came and she rushed and, he, and she hugged me. This breaks many imam policies across the country. <laughs> but I'm like, this is not a good look. And uh, Auntie, I asked her what's wrong, and she says, you know what, you're the first imam that I've seen in over 10 years. And I said, why? She says, because I've never stepped foot in a masjid for 10 years. She said, the last time I was with my son, he's in a wheelchair, and he has cognitive and physical disabilities. They continue to shun us from the masjid until we stopped feeling welcome there. She said, you are the first imam I'm seeing, and Masjid al Nabi is going to be the first masjid that I go to in 10 years. And so this, this speaks volumes of the type of harm that we cause, honestly, if we want to name it for what it is. The type of harm that we cause when we close doors to brothers and sisters and siblings and individuals that did not have them. I don't even need to look far. I can tell you that I grew up uh, you know, with a lot of opportunities. And every time, some of my own loved ones, I grew up with a cousin named Emma's. And when I wanted to join youth programs, I could join those youth programs, but Emma's could not because he was someone with disabilities. When I started joining Quran classes, I could join Quran classes, but he couldn't join those Quran classes because of his disabilities. When I went on to study Islam, I could study Islam, but my cousin couldn't because they did not accommodate to those with special needs. When I went to my first Umrah, he couldn't come with us because they didn't accommodate for those with special needs. 
Right now, mashallah, he is an individual that is a proud father of his own children. He has work, he has a career, he has his life. But his spiritual growth has been stunted drastically, just as an example, because of his inability to access opportunities to develop spiritually and Islamically. And so we as a community have a responsibility to provide equal access to Quranic education, Islamic education, youth programming to people of all diverse abilities and disabilities. And who from us does not have a disability? I challenge you. Who from us does not have a disability? In fact, I, in Muslim right now, in the organization that I'm very honored and proud to be a part of, we're grappling with the fact that maybe the conversation of those with disabilities, the they, them, needs to change into a conversation about we, us. We are a people with disabilities. We are a people that are struggling, right? And making it a conversation that is inclusive of all of us, as opposed to it being those of us that are typically able, accommodating for those that are less able. And the Prophet ﷺ showed it to us. And if time allows, and you permit me, I think about a story in which the Prophet ﷺ was walking out of the masjid with a, a, a companion when he started asking him about his daughters. And it got the companion excited because he's like, man, I think the Prophet ﷺ is about to ask for my daughter in marriage. And who better to be my son-in-law? This is the major, this is as good as it gets. The Prophet ﷺ wants to marry my daughter. To the point that the Prophet ﷺ walked to his house with him. And he entered his house and this companion became extremely excited. And this companion uh, went and told his wife. And then the Prophet ﷺ realized what they were thinking. And he says, no, 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 I'm not inquiring about me. I'm asking about Judaibi. I'm asking about my companion, Sahibi Julaybi, my friend Julaybi. And Julaybi, who we know, was a companion with physical disabilities and deformities. So much so that these individuals, this Sahabi and his wife, when they heard this, it's as if their faces completely changed. But the daughter herself says, Who am I to reject the recommendation of Rasulullah? But this is a Prophet that did not view individuals with, disability, individuals with disabilities as they, them. He viewed them as we and us. He viewed them as my family, this is my brother, he wants to get married. And SubhanAllah, that daughter, Mary anhu, very soon after he went to the battlefield and Julaybi was martyred. And the Prophet ﷺ, he sent the companions, he says, go and find out those who were murdered amongst the companions. They came back and they listed them. He says, no, 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 I'm asking about Julaybi. And, and it shows us that subhanAllah, subhanallah, as if they didn't even take into consideration Julaybi. From, from the, the, maybe the social significance that he didn't carry in their eyes. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I am talking about Julaybi. I'm asking you about my companion Julaybi. Did you find him? They went and they searched and they searched until they found the body of Julaybi. This body that was physically deformed and physically disabled, but was worth more than the world to the Prophet. ﷺ. They brought the body of Julaybi to the Prophet. ﷺ. The hadith says the Prophet ﷺ became a pillow. We said it became a pillow for the body of Julaybib. And the Prophet ﷺ enveloped Julaybib. And he says, Julaybib minni wa ana min Julaybib. Julaybib minni wa ana min Julaybib. I am from Julaybib and Julaybib is from me. Not they and them, we and us. We are a community with disabilities. And we are a community that needs to overcome the disabilities. We are not a community that ostracizes or excludes individuals with disabilities. We are a community that considers this a part of our beautiful fa fabric and a part of our landscape. Sister further thoughts on that? Um, moving into the concept of um, you know providing solutions and not just speaking in theory, inshallah, we want to utilize the last 10 minutes and the following questions. So, Sister Ala, um, what are some solutions and opportunities 
the society has that families with a special needs member may or may not be aware of that can make their mission easier. Um, okay, so I want to share a little bit about a research study that I did over six years ago, where, and I'll be really shallow brief with that and then share some um, follow up resources. But um, I did a study where over 650, around 650 Muslims responded to this study. So in this study, I had a case scenario that I presented. And um, following the scenario were three questions. So the scenario was, imagine you were at a park with your child, and you witnessed a mother with her child at the park. But her child was screaming and flailing on the floor. And, and loud and kicking. What would you, one, say to her? What would you say to your child? Or, and what would you do? Uh, the second scenario, where half of the participants received, was the very same except for one added sentence, which was, the mother was at the park, you're, you and your child are watching, the mother and her child, the child is flailing on the floor, um, but she turns to you and she hands you a card that says, my child has autism. We call this disclosure. She discloses the disability. Then it's followed with three questions. What would you say to her? What would you say to your child? And what would you do? In the first scenario, there were responses that said, I would tell my child, see, that's not how you behave in a park. I would take advantage of that opportunity to teach my child how to behave or I would turn away and mind my own business. For the second answer, the second scenario where individuals received that disclosure, they said things like, I will, uh, I will smile at her. I will ask her if she needs help. I will turn to my child and I will take advantage of this opportunity to teach them, see a law makes people different and there are differences in, in people's differences, right? And this is a blessing from Allah. Um, other things like I would ask her if she needs help, um, I would start a conversation. And the reason I bring this research, um, I bring this up, is because, yes, in our community, there is still stigma around disabilities and around uh, special needs. And we, we, are, we are judgmental, often. But what my study proved was that when a Muslim it learns that there's a disability here, present, when they're being told about this disability, they're actually more likely to be kind, to be compassionate, to want to support, to be helpful, or to just want to connect. And I'm sharing this because I want to encourage our families that do have special needs and, and, challenge, and cha are challenged with disabilities to expect that kindness and to put themselves in these spaces, our measured spaces. I'm also um, encouraging this for many reasons. One, our communities need to know what, um, that these disabilities are present in our spaces and this space belongs to everyone, right? So my encouraging everyone to take these spaces is because if you're not taking your, this space, someone else's needs are going to be met. Hold on, let me reframe that. I'm encouraging everyone to take these spaces and make your needs be known so that we are all working toward making those needs be met. Because if it's not, if it's not you, someone else that's louder will make sure their needs are being met in this measure space or in this community space. And uh, my second um, reason is because the responsibility is not only on families with special needs and disabilities to make their needs be Know. And, and I want to remind those who are in leader positions and those who are uh, attending or those who are at home that we need to we need to put forward that effort to ask, to learn, right? We can't sit in the ignorance. Um, brief suggestions. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Mohsen is doing a great job with starting the ball on inclusivity, making sure that masjids are accessible, making sure that masjids have um, resources that um, you know allow family members with disabilities to be present and engaged, but we do need to do more. I mean, in Hamza, and we do need to do more. Um, I'm going to encourage that the masjids are like if your masjid is not Muslim certified, get Muslim certified. It's the basic. 
and, and that means to make sure that the masjid, the, the, masjid, the community center is accessible, but also Muhsin has a toolkit that offers talking points. So let's get the conversations going in our masjid, right? Um, other things are uh, start a, a, a community fund for special needs. Get um, Muslims trained in special needs services like respite care. Respite care is where someone can come to your home and for an hour or two be with your, with your family member that has special needs or be with you, right? And that gives time for the other family members. And um, can I keep going? <laughs> Um, so yeah, our mission should be paying for this training. We need more Muslims in, in this. Um, educational programs, so that we're learning about all the different types. They just listed off like the, the general idea of what types of disabilities exist. And like the Sheikh said, we all have disabilities. There are some that you can see and there are some that you can't see. But it doesn't mean that they're not there, and so we should learn about them. And that helps us become more present and connect with each other. Um, Masjids should have buddy programs. Right, where um, you can connect a family or someone without a specific disability with individuals who do have disabilities so that there are opportunities to maybe set up a phone call so you talk every day, go to the mall, have companionship, right? Um, go for a walk together so that there is a sense of connection. Uh, we should have uh, support groups in our mission spaces, in our community spaces, and those support groups um, could be for caregivers, support groups for individuals with special needs and uh, support group for siblings uh, of family members with special needs so that there is a sense of like, like we're in this together right um, social events for caregivers uh, social events for individuals with, with disabilities um, and then there's something that i want to highlight which is elders elders with disabilities um, like dementia there's a real like research is very heavy on this aspect of loneliness and how loneliness can be so detrimental and I think it's very important that we do not forget this vulnerable population. And um, and I mean, one of the suggestions is, is events for, 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 for elders. I used to run a, a storytelling um, circle for elders with dementia at a memory loss center, and it's fun. And they don't have to remember anything, but they tell stories and they're engaging, and so you're not forgetting another part of our population, our people, right? I'm sorry for my long language. Zegla, Shafal, if you have anything to add. So we're, we're coming uh, close on time. We have 10 minutes left of the session. Uh, usually this doesn't allow opportunity for questions and answers. Um, so if anyone um, has anything outstanding that they'd like to ask, we do have a mic. Um, it, it would be preferred to speak into the mic so that the AV could capture uh, the question. Um, and if, if there aren't any, we could proceed in Shabbat with the last question. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Ibrahim Zaini. Um, I'm a Mass POT member. I don't kind of trance that around, but I wanted to say that because there is a DEI initiative that's taking place um, as the Board of Trustees for Mass National. What's I'm, DEI? The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, and I think that this is getting missed because a lot of it, um, it's not to kind of diminish from race, um, national origin, et cetera. But I think disability is something that is missed in this conversation. So if it's, uh, I know what that's on the EC. So if, if we can just connect um, and then have Mohsen in your services, because I think it does need to be included in the conversation, because really it is mainly a discussion about uh, race and other things, and disability is not really talked about. Yeah, well, I, I, mean, I appreciate you uh, you mentioning that. I absolutely, I mean, I think that, that those are channels that are always open. I think it's a needed conversation. I think in the era of identity uh, being something that's super focused on, and there's a lot of value to that. Uh, I love the idea of thickening the narrative of what our identities consist of to include the diversity of our abilities and disabilities. So, thank you for mentioning that. I'm happy to share information with you, and we can definitely talk about what it looks like for Muhsin and just expanding the services that, that we can provide in Shalom. That's a great uh, point, Brother Ibrahim. Um, I, I think uh, as well, um, it's something that's overlooked, so thank you for bringing it to my attention as well. Make sure it's covered on the EC level. 
a sister please in the town. Salam alaikum. So I have more of a comment, not really a question, but as you can see, there's a small amount of people who are in the room hearing this topic and listening to this um, as we talk about opening up the hearts of others. It would be wonderful to see this topic be on the, in the main hall. Um, I think the conversation really needs to be with a larger community. Um, I would venture to guess most of the people that are probably in this room are many families or caregivers with special needs. Um, and we're always the one that's listening to these conversations. And the ones that really need to hear about this um, is a larger group. So I would hope that maybe we can think about expanding it in the future into a main hall event, inshallah. That's a great point, sister. Just like a little The brother of the mass board is <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> and yeah. Inshallah, absolutely. Inshallah, I'll take that feedback. Our brother can. Sorry, I'm going to uh, my name is Dr. I have a question. Um, as an emerging young adult, I was going to ask, what is my first step when I leave this conference? Like, um, do I reach out to my mission? Do I educate myself? Do I contact my son? All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. You're on the right track, Michelle. You know, what, you know what's most important is to have something you already have, which is that you care. And the fact that you care enough to want to do something about it, it speaks volumes to the type of person that you are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you and bless you. Uh, reaching out to Mursin, Mursin is always doing respite volunteer trainings. Uh, Mursin can come to your masjid, um, give a khutbah, start up a volunteer group. Talk about starting a Mursin weekend school because people with special needs need weekend school as well. Right? Um, I want to I speak to what the sister mentioned, that typically, as if it isn't enough of a challenge to be an individual with special needs, as if it's not enough of a challenge to be a caregiver of people with special needs, all of a sudden those of us that have special needs or are caregivers are also the greatest advocates and the only advocates. And that's like an assumed title or position. So those of us that are typically uh, able-bodied and so on and, and, and cognitive, be more uh, a normative, we have an equal and greater obligation because we may have more bandwidth to step up to the plate and to have that voice for individuals, right? So I think that all of the steps that you mentioned are super important, becoming informed through these trainings, representing it to your masjid, reaching out to info at mursin.org, getting the ball rolling from there, and I'm looking forward to future conventions when this is on the main stage, inshallah, to Salam so I don't, um, just a side note, um, my, I don't have any kids that have special needs, but I think this is very important to be aware of, so I'm part of the mainstream. Um, question, please forgive me, because I'm becoming more and more aware of this, but uh, what is the, because I have nephews that, I don't know if it's behavioral issues or it's autis autism, because it's not diagnosed. Um, and for me, I feel like some people use autism as an umbrella to say, oh, my kid has autism, and they, they don't, they don't take them to a doctor or anything, but they have behavioral issues or they're not great parents and disciplining their kids and their kids they just run around ragged or whatever. So what is the threshold between somebody like a child who's not diagnosed that has autism and a child that just needs to be disciplined, not beat up, but disciplined and having structure and, and not just running ragged and people just saying he has autism. So what's the difference and what is the, the threshold? Is that hard? Okay, so I actually want, I was going to do a quick research because I, I forgot the numbers, but, um, but autism is quite common, actually. And I think it's very important that we um, take the needs of our children or the children or our family members uh, uh, important, like take them seriously, right? Um, but certainly not to di diagnose without professional um, uh, care. And so I would say, and I would suggest right there for you, in your home to actually recommend getting that, um, getting seen by a specialist, right? Um, getting seen by a specialist, and the reason is because having a diagnosis opens the doors for knowing what services to use. And when I said like, it's uh, autism is quite common, I think it's one in every six. Boys um, are, boys see it, uh, it's, it's more seen, visible in boys um, in research, um, and oftentimes because girls are misdiagnosed. But I think it's very important that we actually um, feel comfortable going to the professionals. 
and asking for the assessments that are needed because then that helps us access the resources. There was something else I wanted to add. I actually have a list of um, additional resources here if anybody wants to come and see them afterwards, but as much as I want this in our Muslim community, I'm going to highly, highly recommend that individuals and families like, just go find the resources that exist outside of our community because there are a lot. There's funding, there's money that's just being given, right? And I want I to very much encourage that families with um, special needs, and whether you know it or don't know it, number one, go get assessed. Number two, find the resources and, um, and, 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 and allow for your, your environment to be one that flour, like, encourages flourishing like advancement for each of your family members, right? Um, everyone has the poten high potential, and we just need to find what ways um, to help each person reach their fullest potential. And, and that's why I'm like, encouraging that we seek out services. Um, yes, yeah, so not to just diagnose children that are misbehaving, but to, to see what if it is ADHD? What if it is that they're struggling and, and we don't know what is happening in their brain and how, can, how, um, how, how difficult their world is when we don't know how to understand the way they're experiencing it. So I recommend if you do see these challenges, get the assessment, don't wait on it, there's no reason. Early intervention is so critical. It's so critical. Just that sister, I really appreciate your time. May I take the last question? Um, I uh, thought if you wanted to ask final thoughts. Just wanted to, and I definitely want to hear your, your, I just want to say that we have, the Muslim community has a very unique, I was going to say strange, but I want to be a little bit more positive, so I said you that. The Muslim community has a very strange relationship with diagnosis. A diagnosis is a diagnosis, not a death sentence. A diagnosis is a diagnosis, not a death sentence. Uh, we treat diagnoses as death sentences. That say, I have anxiety, therefore I can't drive. I have depression, therefore I will always be sad. It should be, I have anxiety and I can still smile. I have anxiety and I love to cook. I have ADHD and I got an A in men's. Uh, and, and so I think that the Muslim community, we like, we have, I, I don't know if it's, their, their research needs to be done, I'll, uh, I'll nominate Sister Anna to do the research, inshallah, but uh, research needs to be done as to uh, what, what, is, what is the story behind that, but sometimes we think that this is, the, a diagnosis is the beginning of a story, not the end of a story. It's the beginning, and I love when Sister I mentioned Nils Matagos and reward her. This idea of, of, of it opening doors and opening opportunities because it's it's where we begin the conversation of okay, where do we go from here? As opposed to it being like, okay, therefore I am now constricted to the DSM 5 definition of this, you know, disorder or whatever the case may be. No, it gives us a context in which we uh, tread that path and we navigate it with wisdom and, and with care and precision and shalom. Go ahead, brother. So, um, what Yeah, so I know, I do know that Mohsin is working with Hafar Adin. Uh, Mohsin is an organization, Muslim Understanding and Helping Special Education Needs, national organization uh, for those with disabilities and their families, is working with some of the matrimonial services that are, you know, legitimate and 
recognizing our community and they're working to create uh, some really uh, interesting and creative and fun spaces where people can kind of uh, explore the possibilities of uh, marriage, inshallah ta'ala, together. I also want to say that there is some cultural unlearning that's needed in our homes and in our families surrounding what qualifies someone as a good spouse. Uh, what does a marriage look like with a husband that is wheelchair bound or a wife that has a cognitive disability? Uh, what does it look like to have a family that may not lead to an individual having children per se? Right? And just to explore these different kind of uh, outside of the box uh, you know, families that are very much what families with those with special needs look like and it's important that we inshallah ta'ala uh, you know, begin to have those conversations as our organizations lay the framework for that inshallah. Maybe I can just add one um, aspect, uh, uh, addressing the component of loneliness that um, uh, I'm not sure the specific circumstance of, of for the questioner, but um, Marriage might be one avenue, but there also may be loneliness in marriage, and so I want to really emphasize that marriage might be one avenue for, uh, as a solution to you know, companionship. For individuals with special needs, for elders, for adults with special needs, um, I want to say let's embrace more companionship and outings. Um, I feel bad I have a friend that uh, messages me frequently saying let's go to the mall together and I can probably only go once, a while, once in a while. But I think when we all gather to just do things together and to create buddy systems, um, and then my hope is that within our Muslim community we do, we do address this aspect of loneliness through more social events and, and creating a buddy system. And, and for the young um, emerging adult, the brother who came and asked the question, I'm just so grateful that you came on the mic and you said, what can I do right now? He said, just find a friend and say, I want to have a 15-minute conversation, a 30-minute conversation, and that would probably make, make their day for an individual with special needs who is not getting those phone calls from a friend. Right? And then that might be a small, a small uh, a way forward. I really want to appreciate everyone's time here. We're, we're, um, we have to wrap up. We're five minutes over. I do want to um, you know, thank everyone for the privilege of having me here. I wasn't meant to moderate this session. It was all meant for me to moderate this session. Uh, but alhamdulillah, it's a privilege to be here. I look forward to meet with folks um, you know, once the session concludes. Uh, the speaker's available for one-on-ones. Inshallah. So we don't have to rush out of the room. We can't stay here forever, but we will be able to adjust um, your personal questions. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Subhanallah. Yes, ma'am.